Today's video is sponsored by Back for Blood. Check the link in the description on how you can get your copy today. If you're an OG fan of the channel, you know we started out with Left 4 Dead lore videos and even the very first Why You Wouldn't Survive was the Left 4 Dead Zombie Apocalypse. So it feels awesome to know we have something succeeding it, but with much deadlier and bigger results. With a wider array of mutation ridden, ridden, to fight back against more of the immune cleaners, it's easy to see how this action-packed fight for humanity's survival could have you not surviving. And today's video is possible thanks to Back for Blood themselves for sponsoring it. Check the description below on how to get your copy today, because playing this is the only feasible way of you surviving this scenario. Because boy oh boy, you ain't surviving this one. You are not a special plot armored individual, and if you think you are... So what makes you so special? Today we are discussing the I'm a walker, I'm a hawker, I'm a midnight stalker. You got the devil inside ya, literally. All aboard the battle bus, one pandemic that actually would have horse dewormer possibly work, chargers and boomers and hunters on steroids, believe in the heart and meta of the cards, a lot of kids and teens across the world are gonna be confusing their mothers when they scream, God damn it, mom, come save me! If you have helminthophobia, a fear of being infested with worms, you're probably gonna die before this even starts. Violante's distant cousin, water is the source of all life, and in this case, all death. Finding money on the floor lets me buy cards on the floor. If you pick two bruisers, you get a free win card in swarm mode. The game where people will comment, just play Left 4 Dead on every post, video, and ad without actually playing it and the worm ridden son of a bitch game itself. Today we are telling you why you wouldn't survive Back for Blood's ridden zombie apocalypse. Originating in Ping Long Uwet National Park in Quebec, Canada, scientists had been excavating deep in the snowy landscape. It was there that they happened upon a small worm-like creature in a cryogenic state due to permafrost in a massive crater. Its origins are still unknown, but some believe it to be of extraterrestrial descent. Taking it to Quebec City for analysis, the thawed parasitic worm, when exposed to water, attacked the first living thing it could. Piercing through the scientist's flesh, it immediately traveled through his bloodstream to the brain, almost instantly taking over and mutating them, causing a litany of symptoms like headaches, convulsions, external growths, skin discoloration, and protruding veins, and of course, driving the host to become mad and brutally attack other people. What would become known as the devil worm itself could be based on the real-world parasite Toxoplasmosis gondii, a similar parasite that will invade the brain of critters like mice and small birds to make them lethargic and easy pickings for predators. It will lie dormant in fecal matter and spread into dirt and water, allowing it to easily spread to humans, with roughly 11% of the US population already having this parasite in their brains. Yeah, you could have this worm in your brain right now. In rare cases, when exposed to a human's gray matter, the parasite can alter the brain's chemistry to produce more dopamine as well as affecting the mood of a person enough to cause violent outbursts and cases of schizophrenia. Which, looking at the immediate behavior of the Ridden, doesn't seem too far-fetched to make these connections. Which, quick shout out to Roanoke for letting me use this footage. While inside a host body, the devil worm will asexually reproduce and create eggs, most likely in the brain as shown by some of the infected having enlarged veins, worm-like growths, and mutations on their head and body. From from there, it could produce dozens to hundreds to even thousands more of these parasites in your brain that could easily be spread to others in a short amount of time. Their voracious and invasive nature would cause the infection to spread from Canada to far reaches of the United States and the rest of the world, as shown by islands even being overrun within weeks shutting down governments, crippling armies, and driving humanity to near extinction as they struggle to survive and the ridden themselves lying dormant as they gather their masses, biomasses, and most importantly, flock to and infest water sources. But the question comes to pass, how did one singular worm go from taking a long, cold siesta to taking over the world with a worm-ridden army? Oh, that's why they're called the Ridden. It just dawned on me because they are ridden with worms. How did that not dawn on me until now? <laughs> 
Well, the parasite works best in breeding by being exposed to water, and more importantly, bodies of water. From the first drop of water that hit that first worm, we could see how violently it awakens this naturally unnatural species. Throughout the world, it is observed how worm-ridden individuals will flock to and culminate biomass in open bodies of water, like lakes and ponds, and even seek out man-made water sources like fountains, pools, and most frightening of all, water treatment facilities. Yes, they will seek out these facilities and make sure the water we drink is gonna be polluted. Meaning that even early on in the outbreak did the ridden attempt to bolster their numbers by allowing millions of these worms to wriggle into our drinkable water and fertile soil for agricultural crops to infect thousands of people before we even realize it. Notices through the game even say to not drink water unless it is boiled. It's possible that even seawater could be infested with these parasites as far off islands like Cuba and Jamaica have been decimated by the outbreak. Methods like chlorination, saltwater, filtration, and more could not stop the devil worm from polluting water supplies. From there, the ridden could transfer these parasites wriggling through their bodies by forcefully biting, scratching, vomiting, exploding, and hurling lobs of their own flesh at non-infected personnel to infect more of the population. They're like cysts or, or tumorous growths, invasive, but instead of being confined to the body, they're spreading externally. As we can even see remnants of worms bursting out from the very blood of killed infected. Look at them just wiggling around in there. Ugh. The time it takes for an individual to turn is not too long when it first breaks out, but over time is near instant. As we see with one survivor in this cinematic being bitten, dragged to safety by the doc, and becoming a ridden only for doc to blow his brains out. Shit. Infection reports by the CDR even state the only way to know if you're infected is simply if you don't turn into one of them. Which brings us to the ridden themselves. The most seen and frequent ridden, otherwise known as common ridden, will act most reminiscently of the basic soldiers of the zombie genre, ranging from slow moving walkers to 28 days later slash left for dead runners to grotesque, deformed individuals like the infected of The Last of Us, rushing at you recklessly and violently without any care for their own well-being, as the parasite, much like any real-world parasite, will thrust its host into any kind of danger and risk the body's death so that it may spread further. It does not care what happens to its host body. But more so than commons having a difference in how fast they can approach you, do they show physical deformations? Some worms either bump up through their skull skin or just outright have large worms consuming the entirety of their heads. Some will have their skulls and bone fragments sharpened to cause sharpened quills to protrude through their skull and skin to possibly act as a way to further harm an uninfected people and prevent themselves from being attacked by melee weapons. Since these worms will be working overtime on the host body of a living human, some may reach critical proportions, causing the cysts they create in the brain to fully consume the cranium to become volatile ridden. If you cause enough damage to these giant cysts, it will make their head explode and spread highly noxious and infectious acid in every direction while also causing enough force to knock people off their feet. The parasite can also work to make the body more resistant to an infectious disease's worst enemy, fire. After exposure to flames, some ridden will have their flesh charred to the point of hardening their skin and retaining this super dense heat to constantly set areas near it ablaze while also being resistant to any kind of fire thrown at it, making approaching this particular common near impossible as it will start to burn you alive if you get near it or if it gets a hold of you. Although this particular common's lifespan will not be for long and could be an emergency mutation caused by the devil worm to maximize its host deadliness factor. Which leads into an important and critical matter on the devil worm's effect on the human body, and more so, what it can do to it over time, even after death. The parasite can mutate humans in a wide number of ways, but for a majority of the population, much like Left 4 Dead's green flu, most will have minimal to moderate physical changes, while some will form it into deadlier creatures. However, unlike the green flu where the virus relied on pre-existing conditions within a human to specifically mutate them into specials like a fat guy turning into a boomer or a muscle-bound jerk turning into a tank, the devil worm has much more horrific and 
and grotesque methods of creating its stronger organic hosts. Now, the beginning of the outbreak will be riddled with common ridden flooding the streets and attacking anyone they can, but nothing more than them and their variations for a certain period of time. For a short time, it will seem like the ridden as a whole will recede and basically disappear, allowing humanity to get back on its feet. However, this respite of time for settlements and outposts is only the calm before the storm. The infected have receded for a reason, with prior infected dying out from malnutrition exhaustion, and ironically dehydration due to the parasite not needing the host alive, things will start to change for the worse with the more dead bodies there are. Once the infected numbers have hit a breaking point, the devil worms will begin to harness and gather the flesh of any biological creatures they can, from farm animals to rodents to humans, as we see the skeletons of livestock and other animals throughout the game in these really disgusting looking uh, biomass piles. Now you could say the devil worm infected other animals like those proposed, but instead of making ridden animal variants, animals like cows would simply die once the brain was invaded by the parasite, as the parasite itself would only deem human biology as suitable enough to spread its infection efficiently. Of course, over time, an infected host human can and will die out. They will not have a good lifespan. So instead of letting the corpse go to waste, the devil worm inside you will be considerate enough to go green and recycle and begin to work in a very different way with your corpse. Devil worms could already be releasing a chemical throughout our body that alters our DNA to mutate and exist on its own outside of our own living cells, much like a cancer cell. But besides the physical changes of the common infected could allow the parasite to restructure the flesh of a dead body and repurpose it in order to create different forms of life. Pushing it further by having the ridden commons even eating from these biomasses to possibly mutate their own types further, this will tend to happen at, of course, accumulations of water, but also can be found where large populations of people have gathered during the onset of the parasite's outbreak. Keep that in mind for later. Having devil worms infesting decaying masses, large piles of organic bodies will meld and fuse and eventually form expansive, festering nests, much like Dead Space's Necromorphs or Halo's Flood, lending more to the theory that this parasite was born from space. Covering large structures like the insides of schools, sewers, farmlands, and even evacuation centers, enveloping any vehicles that survivors may attempt to use and escape in, as it will constantly grow in order to create more beings that will serve its purpose, causing focal points of its essence to develop into yellow glowing nodes that act as vital organs to these nests. If these nodes are destroyed periodically, the nest very well may totally die out and cease cultivation of mass. We've been through this, okay? I'm cultivating mass. Stop saying that. You are not cultivating mass. And if you are, stop cultivating and start harvesting. Bro. Attacking these nodes may seem like the proper way to extinguish further ridden outbreaks. However, upon damaging them, the nest itself will let out screeches of pain like it is alive and alert all nearby ridden to protect it by the dozens or even hundreds. But why the need to make these nests? Well, they have the sole purpose to churn out what will be the biggest threat to your survival if the water, common ridden, or chaos of a lawless society didn't already end you, and that is the special ridden. From these biomasses will emerge over a dozen types of different creatures, three of which are playable ridden in the new swarm mode that will also persistently appear to strike you down in the campaign mode against the playable cleaners and prevent their mission to fight back. Every beast, despite having tough and fleshed and hide, will all have specific points on their body where a similar exposed node to the nest can be extremely sensitive to external damage. It is their weak point. Of these three major infected within the over dozen, three more differentiated specials have formed derived completely from the original form with minor or heavily different characteristics. Now you might be confused what I'm going on about, but think of it like this. There's the boomer, smoker, and hunter. What if there were three different forms of those specials? That's what we're getting into. While two other mutations exist on their own to slow down survivors of the sleeper and snitcher, and four tough to kill boss ridden, roaming the earth, and in a singular but not entirely exclusive case, we have even one kaiju level threat ready to decimate townships. 
So with all that said and done, rambling about the specials and being vague about it, let's get into the first mutative ridden ever shown and discuss the Stinger type and its three classes. With the Stinger family of specials, each one will have mutated to allow them to grow an extra pair of arms while also developing their muscular structure where they can leap up stories high in a single bound, probably to work in urban environments or forest with high standing trees. Having ruptures on the front and back of their bodies, most of this family are able to produce webbing in their chest. This webbing can be applied all throughout their body to allow them to cling to walls and vertical surfaces to more easily hunt prey. Because of their reliance on being agile and dexterous, the body has remained relatively frail, making them just as killable as any other regular common ridden, if you can shoot them down because they are just so jumpy and all over the place. They're like a damn flea. Now, the name brand Stinger itself harnesses its webbing into spear-like projectiles from its mouth to not only harm survivors, but to also cause the webbing to pop and temporarily slow and blind them. If you're not impaled and killed by this, the hawker could come in and hurl similar lobs of spider-like webbing made from its internal organs in order to envelop you to completely incapacitate you. You will be binded in this kind of cocoon stuck to the ground. If you are not freed from this mucus mess, any number of nearby ridden can come and beat you down or melt away your flesh. And the last of the Stinger family, the Stalker, has its entire head consumed by its weakened cyst. Because of this overgrowth on its cranium, it can no longer use its internalized webbing and instead will use their agility to its biggest advantage by latching onto survivors to bind them and prevent them from fighting back as the Stalker drags them away into danger while they can do nothing about it. You'll get dragged away and maybe impaled by a Stinger shooting you from afar over and over again, or maybe you'll melt away because of the next family. The next family tree is derived from the special ridden called the Reeker, a blow Coated and mutated ridden, covered in fleshed armor with no visible weak point. It will rush into the middle of a group of survivors and throw a flurry of fists to beat them down. Causing enough damage to this thick boy will cause its entire body to burst, spreading a pheromone-infused bile that when making contact with the body of a non-infected person will attract all nearby ridden in the area to your location. Meaning, just like the boomer from Left 4 Dead, you can't kill everything willy nilly and must make distance between some of your threats before taking them out or you risk attracting more of the ridden to your location and possibly getting you killed. Which is the case for the Reeker's two other cousins that explode upon death. The wretch will seemingly have more human biomass fused to its form as we see the faces of former humans on its upper torso that open up to its exposed cyst-like brain. His abilities allow him to spew highly corrosive acid and lots of it long distances to completely dose areas to either close off routes for survivors, drench them while they are pinned down, or just simply melt them away to the bone. The wretch will also burst upon death. However, in his absence, he will leave corrosive acid in a broad radius to burn at survivors as well. And the last is the aptly named Exploder. Yeah, real creative on that one. Who has grown jagged shards across its body and will kamikaze its way into a mass of survivors and explode even if it's not shot at it will blow itself up and this time will send its sharpened appendages in every direction like a giant biological frag grenade meaning you're probably gonna die if you aren't able to kill it before it gets in a certain distance of you they are all basically sacrificial lambs that even all share an ability to just recklessly charge to tackle survivors over and over and intend to explode to send out goo, acid, or shrapnel to infect or kill others. Speaking of playable ridden that won't hesitate to rush and square up against you, we have the Tall Boy family. Standing nearly a dozen feet tall, these lanky fellows will don a massive worm ridden growth over their right arm, much like a charger, but think of it on steroids. Each member uses this enlarged arm to assault cleaners and survivors. The Tall Boy itself will simply dash towards the survivor and brutally swing its arm down to the ground to pound them into a bloody pulp. 
Because of its toughened physique that is almost as strong as steel, it can withstand tons of gunfire and explosives, with its only weak point being its shoulder that will separate and kill the host if sufficiently damaged. But it will slam down its fist, take a lot of damage, and even has a tantrum attack that will allow it to slam in every direction. Now we do have the more abrasive brother in the Bruiser that can become an even more difficult foe, being similar to the tall boy except with darker, almost charred looking flesh bone shrapnel sticking out of his collarbone and all throughout his meaty appendage, and within that enlarged arm are the faces of other human beings, meaning the nest it was born from probably resourced more biomass into this special riddance frame to allow it to soak up more trauma, as the bruiser is basically just a slower but tankier form of the tall boy with all of the same attacks of either slamming down its fist in a dashed rage or throwing this fist down in a tantrum and attack in all directions. If the Devil Worm has decided to go to town on this specific variant, then the Crusher will be created, having its arm completely consumed in bloody tentacled appendages that will consume the rest of its head, the Crusher will lose its sense to bash or even hit survivors. But now, because of its worm-like growths, will grab a survivor's entire body and either squeeze it instantly or hoist them into the air to crush the life out of them slowly, not allowing them to escape its grasp unless others kill it beforehand. It's possible these worm-like appendages could also be piercing the flesh of this entrapped victim to inject devil worms inside of them to infect them more easily as well. But with these three big boys, most if not all of us that face it down will not be able to cause nearly enough damage to it before it is already too late and has crushed us with its big meaty claws. Each of these family tree specials also can mutate rapidly even in the midst of combat with survivors, allowing them to regenerate flesh from prior bullet damage, blind survivors by their death explosions, and even make it where you walk slower in their acids so you burn even longer. But besides the playable Ridden, there are two infected, I mean Ridden, that show up in the environment. And that brings us to the walking giraffe neck glow stick that is the Snitcher. While the body of this Ridden is the size of an average human, it's once you get to the neck that it seems like the head was just stretched out by the worms and given a lot more features. A giant node will envelop this new appendage. However, the tentacled growths will have covered and nearly blinded its eyes. To compensate for this lack of vision, the neck will create extra eyes along the base of its neck, although these new eyes barely do anything to increase its visionary capabilities. The snitchers will wander around aimlessly in their environment, and if they are either approached too closely by you or are hit by gunfire or explosives, due to their mutated vocal cords, will let out an ear-piercing screech in order to attract a horde of various ridden to the area. While your ears are ringing and you have potentially gone deaf, you will have to fend off further summoned ridden hordes while you can barely hear and you're getting your bearings together. If you aren't able to kill the snitchers quickly, Quickly after they have summoned a horde, they can run off and continue to scream their mutated lungs out to call in for even more reinforcements, wearing you down even further. While it's possible for you to kill it without it screaming, some of these snitchers have mutated enough to where they can even scream after dying, making them a consistent threat as they wander amongst herds of infected, always giving you that risk that it will summon even more zombies to your area. Our next Ridden took a very different approach to how to attack survivors, and he is known as the Sleeper. As avid FPS gamers would say, they're camping. These special Ridden seem to have used the lower half of their torso's biomass to get rid of their legs in order to create a growth that will stick them to walls with two long bones protruding on the left and right side of them. These four bones then hold up what's left of its now extremely weak and frail body. From there, it will lie in wait for an unsuspecting or rushing survivor to pass by. While some might be able to notice it and easily kill it due to the constant gurgling noises it makes, others who are unfortunate enough to get too close will be immediately pinned down as the four bones will slingshot the sleeper at breakneck speed to tackle you to the ground. From there, the sleeper will maul you to death unless you are freed by someone else or have the strength to wrangle them off. Because of this weakened physiology, even the slightest blunt force or singular bullet will be enough to take it down. The sleepers and snitchers are just constant variables amongst ridden laden areas. 
but occasionally you're going to run into giant boss infected that will either come from beneath the ground or are just wandering the land. As seen in nests, giant growths will seemingly be riddled with jawlines and teeth and a lot more of what seems to be a body being put together. If nests are allowed to accumulate enough biomass, then larger bosses will begin to appear in water-ridden areas like the ogre. Yeah, yeah, the ogre's protecting a swamp. You can make all your jokes. Usually burrow deep underground, ogres can erupt from beneath survivors in open areas at any given time. It's possible the devil worm mutated its hearing to be sensitive to seismic stimuli, allowing it to detect survivors above ground. Once it emerges, it will slowly but surely make its way to stomp a survivor flat. You could potentially outrun it to get to safety if surrounding ridden don't slow you down before you are crushed, but even getting to high ground or indoors isn't guaranteed to free you from its pursuit. It can reach its massive arms in openings or doorways to attempt to grasp you, and if it is successful, will pick you up and toss you as hard as possible. While in-game you may be able to survive this throw to some degree, let's just say you yourself will look like a mosquito hitting a windshield. If you're too far from it or too high away from it, it can still jump great heights to get on top of high inclinations in buildings. It can also reach into its chest and pull out a giant gelatinous ball of meat and chuck it at you, exploding on impact. And it's safe to say the sheer mass of this meatball will be enough to crush or paralyze you. And it will even use this method to take down vehicles that attempt to escape it as it was able to destroy a helicopter with one throw of its inner meatball. If you are able to avoid this spicy meatball, the splash radius of the ball exploding will still hinder you. And if you aren't immune, definitely infect you as the ball is chock full of wormy goodness. It will take sufficient gunfire to take down and even then then, when it feels threatened enough, will burrow back underground to avoid being killed and bide its time to return, and potentially attack you while you are weakened later on. Now, smaller versions of this, called the Breakers, can also break into the fight being fully clad in chitinous armor. Possibly a fully developed form of the Tall Boy, this boss ridden will quickly rush towards you in order to unleash a flurry of devastating blows. It's nearly impossible to take down single-handedly as its relentless pursuit is aided by its high feats of agility and leaping prowess to reach and once again turn you into a blood and pus-filled pancake. It is covered in armor and it's just there to punch to death. But important to note because of the breaker though, is that its chitinous armor could have also sparked similar mutations in lesser ridden, meaning sometimes specials and commons could also start donning this hardened plating to defend their weak points and make killing the general hordes of infected a much more difficult time, exhausting all your ammunitions much more quickly. But besides the brute force of the breaker and ogre, we do have a consuming terror lurking further in the world. World. Hags will stand tall as the least human looking beasts, almost looking like mole rats, with withered but sturdy bodies, huge hands adorned with sharpened claws, and large upper torsos. But most noticeable is the worm like tentacles wriggling from its head and the over half dozen human arms reaching out from its mouth. Think of those nightmare scenarios of hands reaching out to you to pull you into the darkness. That is the hag. Honestly, it's the most terrifying creature this series has put out. It will roam aimlessly and even approach you, but will not attack unless it is injured. Think of it like a wandering witch from Left 4 Dead 2. Once it has been provoked, it will chase down the person that disturbed it without falter. And unless it is gunned down or injured enough to where it burrows away to escape like the ogre, it will grasp you and not hesitate to put you in its maw and swallow you whole with all of those hands pulling you in. Once your body has been fully consumed by the hag, it will run off to find a good place to dig and if allowed, will tunnel into the earth so that now its expanded belly can fully digest you with no interruptions. You will be underground being fully digested after being pulled into a dark hole. Being what looks like a mole rat's fast food in the blink of an eye because you panicked and shot this abomination will be your last mistake. And speaking of abominations, we have one special ridden left and it's a big one.
Now, a little context. During the outbreak in the weeks following, military, disease control, and government efforts will attempt to shelter thousands of people in quarantine camps to keep them safe and prevent further infection numbers. However, all this will do is allow an ample amount of potential hosts to be used for the devil worm's infection. For those that get infected and turn within quarantine and armed townships, well, near the beginning, you're going to be executed swiftly by armed individuals. That's going to happen regardless. And when mass death counts start to rise, the usual methods of disposing bodies is either going to be to burning them or doing what was done in game by Act 3 and having a mass grave of dead bodies that were to be buried. Because traditionally, many humans don't want to burn the bodies of their loved ones. They want to bury them in a more traditional and ceremonial manner. But don't do that! here. This is an awful, dangerous, and very unadvisable action because, as we discussed earlier, the more dead bodies and biomass that is bunched together, the larger the devil worm can create nests and breeding grounds, especially near sources of water. Because of the mass graves made by the quarantine camp, the worms went to town with all the dead bodies that they had at their disposal and had the chance to create their strongest monstrosity yet, known as the Abomination. A kaiju sized beast that will reside deep underground creating intricately connected tunnel systems and hollows for it to reside in while it harnesses the underground moist and dark features to culminate more of the devil worm's influence. It can come from beneath the ground either by emerging its entire body and form to attack and destroy cities or allow its back tentacles to pierce through the earth's crust to slam survivors, vehicles, and buildings, preventing its main body from really receiving any damage and allowing the tentacles to take the brunt of force. If its tentacles take enough damage, they can also spew out gallons of corrosive acid in every direction to attempt to burn you alive. If every tentacle is damaged thoroughly, they will recede deep into the earth, and the abomination will attempt to regenerate them below with the biomass tunnels it resides in. If a team of elite immune cleaners descend into the organic depths, they can attempt to kill it at its source. But this would require avoiding being flattened by more of its tentacles, being eaten alive by this massive head, or while you're trying to fight the monster's head and tentacles yourself, being massacred by common and special ridden that come to protect it. If the cysts and nodes within its head are destroyed, it will try and escape you from the caverns to ascend to the surface to attack settlements and create more dead bodies before it dies out. It will require you walking through tunnels of bottomless pits, towering bridges, and the legions of the infected while only being able to shoot at its exposed nodes to attempt to try and kill it. But more than likely, you would be crushed by its towering footsteps, its trained tentacles that are following you wherever you go, or falling to your death. It took the combined efforts of a neurotoxin, elite cleaners, and a stroke of luck to even take down this one abomination. But I really do have to say, with the militaries already totally devastated and most of the human population gone, do you honestly think you could survive against this giant gaping maw that is the abomination? And that's just the beginning, as more and more mutations of the Ridden will eventually be created, and some even more evolve like kaiju beasts standing dozens of stories tall will definitely be created as many civilizations of the world would have resorted to mass graves and led to other abominations to lay waste to us. It's gonna be happening all over our little planet. Now, with all these threats coming into question, maybe you do think you could survive the countless trials that the devil worm burrows into the soil of our world. Maybe you are important. Well, what would make you important and be able to fight legions of parasite-ridden bastards? That's right, being immune. Of course, you really wouldn't have a playable character in a zombie-based video game unless they were immune, right? <laughs> Well, I mean to the Devil Worm's influence. 
What exactly causes certain people to not be taken control of when the devil worm enters their bodies is still quite unknown. It's still early to get this kind of information, but most likely comes down to either your genetic makeup and genome or having a family tree where your genetic lineage had developed a strong resistance against parasitic influence. But it would also come down to how healthy a person is and their pre-existing conditions. As stated by Doc in an interaction with Mom, that Mom herself does not have a natural immunity to the parasite like every other playable character in Back for Blood. And she instead has an undisclosed illness that causes the devil worms to avoid infecting her brain. It's possible it could be hypothesized just like the movie version of World War Z. Excuse me, why? that any terminally ill person that has a really not so favorable disease could be avoided by the worms as they see these sick people as not suitable hosts to take control of. While the remnants of humanity have pulled together and found these immune survivors, instructed them on how to fight the ridden, and labeled them as cleaners, which think of them like special agents that are deployed to take out nests and weaken the reach of the ridden outbreak without risking infection, you can't send normal people to fight the ridden because they would get infected way too easily. Let's say you become one of these special people that are known as the cleaners. It's not like being immune to the parasite won't still mean you won't end up dead, as your body, no matter how pure it is, can still be butchered, ripped apart, and have your meaty chunks thrown in the biomass pile for further nest growth and the creation of further special ridden. Although in some rare cases, do the infected that find these immune, do they actually have the hawkers bind them to walls and encase them in cocoons, possibly either to slowly feed on them or to slowly implement parasites into the body over time to see about overriding their natural immunity to them, possibly showing a modicum of gathered intelligence instead of outright just trying to infect and kill at every moment's notice. But the fact, again, is even if you hit the genetic lottery or have a deadly disease that's already in your body before the outbreak, finally giving you a benefit in life besides disabilities or something, doesn't mean you still won't die or end up being a spider's science experiment. Now, humans are not the only target of these pesky parasites, as other animals have been observed or hypothesized to be used by the ridden. Swarms of locust-like insects can also be indoctrinated by the devil worm, looking to encircle survivors and slowly eat away at their flesh to hinder them more so that human and human-like ridden can more easily infect and or kill them. I mean, in a hairy situation of fighting dozens of zombies and suddenly seeing a swarm of insects circling around you, you're going to be basically thinking judgment day has come and you're just going to be slowly eaten alive by the microscopic to the human size level. It's also possible the bird population, most namely crows, have also had their meat tainted. A common trope in the game is that disturbing a murder of crows can immediately summon a nearby horde of ridden. Now some can just say, well, crows are loud and that's what attracted the infected. But in nature, many birds carry parasites predominantly in their digestional tract. And while they're picking at the nests and decaying corpses of the ridden, causing them to suddenly fly off because you pissed them off or disturbed them could have them freak out and alert hordes because of the parasites in their stomach feeding off these corpses. Or maybe even that crows themselves are in fact fully infected and are basically being used as carrier pigeons to transport chunks of flesh to nests to let them grow further. You have these crows kind of working as sleeper agents for the ridden. Because I mean, if you really think about it, you have to think of the body language of a common ridden. They're jolty, they're kind of sporadic, they're always grunting, and they don't disturb a murder of crows, but if you simply walk near them, that sets them off? It really makes you think that that might be the case. Either way, it is still a major detriment to your health knowing just simply startling some birds could have you surrounded by ridden in seconds. Now, the only great enough countermeasure we were able to muster within the game was a concocted neurotoxin by Dr. Rogers. Being a chemical and gas compound that when exposed to the worm or ridden can have heavily weakened them to become easy kill fodder to ammunition and weaponry. Released either by timed grenades or artillery, it can also be launched in large portions to slow down a giant nest from forming more. 
but that is solely dependent on having someone proficient in parasitology, or maybe you got a spare Roanoke lying around. But I doubt you'll be happening upon any M5 gas bombs to be attacking hive minds of the Ridden. Most top scientific minds at this point will already be parts of the biomass pile. I mean, the first people that were infected were top scientific minds. And even if this toxin was created, the way this parasitic virus mutates, it could easily mutate to withstand the toxin. The parasite. These things need to adapt and mutate to survive. The same as a virus. That's why we never cured the common cold. So it'll be up to you to survive against everything with no hope for a cure or deterrent. Now, if you've heard all this and think you can survive, what's well, going to come down to this, boys and girls? If you can stop yourself from unknowingly drinking, bathing, or swimming in contaminated water, or eating contaminated crops, if you can somehow survive the initial outbreak of tons of different common infected swarming the streets and breaking down your door, and avoid them biting you or getting their wormy juices in any of your orifices, if you can lie low while the basic commons seemingly disappear for a month and society gets back on track while you get comfy learning basic survival skills and boarding up a safe haven, only for newly formed nests to create a worse threat of the multitudes of mutated ridden, as they can puke on you from afar, pound you till you're a bloody pulp, encasing you in spider-like film to be mauled to death, being impaled by a spider harpoon in the head, being eviscerated by half a man jumping at you at bullet speed, being deafened and swarmed, or just simply being vored and digested alive, crushed to death by a giant meatball, being thrown across a room like an insect and splatted across a wall, only to avoid all of this just to have a kaiju-sized beast and his tentacles rise from beneath you and decimate you and any puny defenses you have with those around you that you have established. All while possibly insects rain down above you and circle around to sting or bite you and infect you if you are not immune. Unless you yourself are immune and can coordinate to wipe out every nest on the planet as soon as possible, you'll just be meat in the pile and your decrepit face probably assimilated into the flesh hammer of a tall, lunky former basketball player. Well, that about closes the book on this chapter in the Back for Blood, Why You Wouldn't Survive. My voice is about to die out because this is a long one, but that isn't the full story or the full scope of what threats lie ahead as future DLCs and expansions will bring to light more mutations of the Ridden that further grow the Devil Worm Empire. And remember again that this video is thanks once again to today's sponsor, Back for Blood. I got a link in the description to go get the game right now. If you want the game easier with a bigger bundle, you can get it on the Xbox Game Pass. Check it out as I do highly recommend the game and want it to be highly replayable far from today. Now, I was openly critical of aspects of the game during the alpha and beta and the videos are still there for you to watch. After playing the full campaign all the way through, I can safely say I was thoroughly surprised about how lengthy, difficult, full, and diverse it actually was. It defeated my expectations of what I assumed might have been a droll experience. The Swarm Mode, aka Versus Mode, is super fun to play through and worth a shot with good friends. Although I would say that certain Ridden like the Bruiser could use some nerfs and reworks, but still, a good time trying to beat the other team's time. It's pretty interesting. The card system makes for unique experiences that I work towards, like a massively fun melee build where I'm just swinging around like a madman, or my friend Cake's tank health build he used to save us during the Abomination boss fight at the end. Left 4 Dead prided itself on unique playthroughs each and every time due to the director and spawn points. And with the counter cards now being played by Back for Blood with the Infected that can give fog, certain increased spawn rates for specials, and more, they ramped up the replayability factor for more dedicated players that will stick with the game. You can get these cards to counteract and it just makes for a more unique and interesting experience for those that have kind of a more competitive mindset. Now I know what some of you are thinking, this is not me shilling out just because they sponsored me, okay? I know some smartass in the comments section is going to say this. 
but I genuinely did enjoy what I've experienced in Back for Blood at launch and can't wait to see what future DLC brings for specials and cleaners alike. Props to Turtle Rock and the dev team for making a rich lore, interesting characters, a detailed experience of the Devil Worm outbreak and its ridden, and just making a fun game. Despite there being issues with the solo mode and how the bots play, there are issues I'm not going to deny. But hey, it's still fun to go through. If you enjoyed today's video, let me know down below. This is a long one, but it's a why you wouldn't survive I've been waiting to make ever since they first announced this game over two years ago. Did I get something wrong? Did I omit or overlook any information? We are only a week out of its release, so I am sure it's bound to happen. Drop a like and subscribe to support the channel. That's all I I'm really asking for my dudes but if you want your name on the screen right now drop a buck or two on patreon or youtube memberships thanks for helping out the channel you ridden riddled wowzers that's a tongue twister try saying that ridden riddled wowzers god damn that's hard thanks to wise fish for whipping together and editing another phenomenal video and thanks once more to back for blood for sponsoring us today check out the description until next time i'm zach ass aka wow such gaming stay happy stay healthy burn the bodies boil your water and get the slaying cleaners and most importantly stay wow well.